Thank you for coming to this session just before lunch. Usually I get the session after lunch and people get sleepy, so hopefully this will not happen this time. So just a few words about me first. Probably this is the only picture you will get of me where I don't look like a serial killer. Uh, my name is Cédric Champeau. I'm French. I'm working for Gradle for um, a bit more than a year now. Uh, I'm also an Apache Groovy committer, so if you use Groovy, and especially if you use any feature in Groovy that came after Groovy 2, uh, most likely I, I, I wrote those features such as the static compiler, the markup template engine, etc., etc., so traits. I'm also the co-author of Groovy in Action, so if you want to buy the book, go. It's going to give me some, yeah, some royalties. I'm always happy to get some royalties. Anyway. So first, a, a small disclaimer about this talk. What I'm going to show you is using what we call the Java software model. So how many people in the room are aware of what we call the new Java software model and maybe use it? OK. So quite a few hands already. So this is going to be using the new Java software model. But as Hans told us this morning, the focus of what we're doing is changing. So we, yeah, we're aware that it's going to be hard for people to switch to the new Java software model now. So everything I'm going to show is using it, but we're going to backport most of the features to the current model so that you can have the same benefits using the current Java software model. So don't worry. Uh, it's, yeah, you don't have to care about the syntax that I'm going to use. It's more the features which are important. OK, so let's get started. So how many of you already know what Jigsaw is? Right? How many tested Jigsaw? OK. Don't worry. Maybe in two or three years, you're going to really start using Jigsaw and start the problems that it comes with. It. So in this talk, basically, I'm going to explain you why it's going to break your applications, why it's going to break Gradle, and how actually we can fix it. So how we're going to provide you with a smooth migration path from Java 6, Java 7, Java 8 to Java 9, which is going to be something really, really breaking. So I'm just going for those of you who don't really know what Jigsaw is, give you some introduction about what it is, what it's going to break, and what problems it's supposed to solve, right? So first, Jigsaw is all about modules. So it's not the modules that we're used to understand in Java world, which is often just a jar, it's really proper modules. And more modules like the OSGI world, but lightweight, right? So one of the most important reasons why Java comes now with Java 9 with the modules is to provide what they call reliable configuration. So most probably all of you faced one day a class path issue, right? Your application just works because you're lucky you just had put the, 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 the jars in the right order in the class path. And just, you just switch the order and just, your application starts to break and you don't know why. And it's all about the class path. Already today we have applications with thousands of jars on class path. And maybe some of you are not lucky and using Windows. And you know that if you have a class path which is too large, what happens? It doesn't start just because you have a limit in the number of arguments that you can put on the class path, right? So that's the kind of problems that you have today. And it's going to be solved with Jigsaw. So already today with Jigsaw, you have an option to use an option file to path the class path. But class path is also going to disappear altogether at some point. And I'm going to explain why. The second aspect, which is already something very, very important, is strong encapsulation. So that's a concept we all know in the object-oriented programming world. Strong encapsulation is the idea that you shouldn't touch what you're not supposed to touch, basically. Okay? So you have visibility of components, visibility of fields, visibility of classes, etc., etc. And traditionally, Java has been very bad at encapsulating things. Right? Even if you put some fields private, you have some tricks that lets you read it. 
You can even modify final fields. That's possible to do. You have even, maybe some of you use unsafe, Compton unsafe. There are some, always some good reasons to use those, right? But for an API designer, that's a nightmare. Because as soon as people start using things that they shouldn't use, you have a problem. So yeah, this talk is about that. It's about how you can use Jigsaw today with Gradle and use Jigsaw maybe tomorrow with Jigsaw. So all those ideas of reliable configuration and stronger encapsulation is all about having strict boundaries between the different modules. So you're going to say, my module needs that other module as a dependency, and it's a runtime and compile dependency, but you can also declare that your module exposes an API. And that is a concept that didn't exist yet in the Java world, right? So for people who maybe have done some, or maybe today do some native world, development, when I'm going to talk about APIs in this talk, it is much closer to the concept of API that we can see in the C++ world, or C world, where you have the .h files that define the API, what users will consume, and you have the .cpp files, which is the actual implementation, right? So it's more API in that world. So modules, what's modules in Jigsaw? This is the way you would define a module, the simplest possible module in the Jigsaw world, the Java Net world. So you have a new file, which is called module-info.java, and inside it's just the descriptor of what is your module. And it looks much like a package definition, but it has more. So we have a module and we give it a name, and we say, okay, that module requires another module. Right, So it means that when your application is going to be compiled, this has to be found on the module path, not the class path, the module path, which is different. And then it means that you can consume the APIs that this module exposes, right? And your module is going to provide an API too. And how do you declare what your module is supposed to expose? you declare packages that you're exporting. So my module declares two packages. One is Kung Fu Bar Alpha. The second one is Kung Fu Bar Beta. And those are two packages that are exported. So say that I have a third package in my module. This is not going to be visible to people that consume my module. This is the major difference, right? And Jigsaw will make sure that you cannot access them either at compile time or runtime. So even if you think you're smart enough and you're going to use reflection, no, it's not going to work, right? You will have problems and at runtime, Jigsaw will tell you, no, you're not allowed to use that class because it hasn't been exposed. So it is packages. So the granularity of what you can expose is packages. And it's inclusive, so it, it isn't transitive. So it means that if, if you have, uh, say, Kamfubar alpha dot internal, the internal package is not exposed. It's only that package and nothing else. And this is probably a convention that you will see more and more in Java. And this is something that we're moving towards in the Gradle code base itself. We have packages with the name internal inside. And that way, it's pretty, yeah, it's pretty easy to recognize that if you consume something that is internal, something is wrong, right? So you can do it, but you shouldn't. With Jigsaw, you won't be able to do it because the internal package will not be exported. So what is module? It declares a dependency onto different modules. Optionally transitive. And this is, this is the difference between dependency management as we see it at the build time. And typically in the Maven or Gradle world today, this is how we do it. We have transitive by default. In the case of modules, we don't want to be transitive by default. And why? Because we're talking about APIs. So it's not what you expose at runtime, it's what you expose at compile time. So if you have an API, 
usually you only want to expose that, but maybe you're exposing types in your public API that are in a different module. And in any case, you, you, you could use the public, requires public keyword, and then it would mean, okay, the types from the dependency are also visible directly from my module. So it's transitive, right? So by default, just be aware that Jigsaw says it's not transitive by default. So you declare a list of packages, and this is something new. This is called a module path, not a class path. So it's different. So Jigsaw, I won't talk about that, but Jigsaw provides uh, a transition path from the class path to the module path. It's very complex. You will have to deal with it at some point. Just be aware that maybe in 10 or 15 years, we won't have the class path anymore. It's going to be the module path and only the module path. And actually, there are tools in the Java uh, GDK that only work if you exclusively use the module path. I'm going to come back to that later. Right. So why is it going to break your applications? Because that's what we care about. First, exports are package-based. So it means that if today in your application you have internal types and public types mixed into a single package, you have a problem. But it's not, yeah, it's not the, the biggest problem. The second aspect is more that two modules, two different modules cannot export the same package. So think about it. You have an application maybe existing today and maybe you package two different jars. And if you think of those jars as modules, you won't be allowed to have the same packages in the two different jars, two different modules. It is not allowed. So what we call the split package problem today in Java, it is not possible to have it anymore as soon as you use mod modules, right? Modules enforce the rule that one jar, one module has its specific packages. And I like to take the example of Groovy as an example of why it is a problem. And typically, we've been very picky on backwards compatibility, binary backwards compatibility. So in Groovy 2, what we did is that we have a big jar, and we split that jar into different what we called modules by that time. And we still called them modules. But we still have some types that are found either in Groovy core.jar or groovy.util.jar, the same packages in different things. And it's not possible anymore with Jigsaw. So it's going to be a problem. And this is going to break your applications, basically. So be aware of that. And what we're going to do in this talk is to explain how can Gradle help with that problem. So first, uh, you have to use, if you want to, 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 to test the demos of that talk, you have to use Gradle 3.0 minus 2, which is the first version that supports running on Jigsaw. Before you could do it, but it was, you had to tweak it somehow. And the idea is more, okay, we all know we have lots of applications. We're going to take them as they are and slowly migrate them so that they're Jigsaw compatible. And basically, the day you're ready to enable Jigsaw, just add Java 9 as a target platform and you're done, basically. That's the idea. So uh, a few words about the Java software model. The idea is that we don't declare what uh, um, how we're building stuff, but what we are building. So we're going to say, I'm building a Java library, I'm going to build a Java application, I'm going to build a microservice, etc., etc. So what rather than how. And it leverages conventions, etc., etc. It's work in progress. Again, in that example that I'm going to show you, don't focus on the syntax, it's not what is important. What is important is the feature. So the first example is pretty simple, actually. I'm going to use uh, an application which has two modules. So uh, core, which is a library, and uh, CLI, which is a common line version. So since you, you saw at the, at the keynote this morning, we love greeters. This is also a greeter, right? So my core library provides a single class, which is greeter.java, the layout, it's pretty common, it's something that you used to have with the um, Maven, Gradle world. What I'm just going to show you now is the greeter, and it's pretty dumb. 
says greet, he takes a name and says hello, some name, right? The build that Gradlefy is using the software model. So what we have here is actually a component and we're just declaring a main component, which is a JVM library. On the other hand, we have that command line module, which will have as a dependency my greeter, my core library. So we have a greeter CLI, and I'm going to show the contents. So I'm sorry for Marco, this test, this application doesn't have any test. It should. So yeah, the, 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 the CLI is really something very dumb. It just creates a git, uh, greeter and then reads from the input stream, well, the standard command line. It reads a name and it prints the, la the name, the name, et cetera, et cetera. So really something very simple. And if we try to build that, everything should be good. So let's see, I have a dependency for my main library onto the core project. So the CLI project depends on the core project. So let's build that. Okay, everything is fine. So, so far, I hope everything is good for you. If you don't understand the layout, just tell me now, because otherwise you're going to be lost. You can continue, I see no. Okay, don't be ashamed. Okay, so now we're going to talk about internal APIs. So, what I'm going to do is that now I want my core library to define something which is internal, right? So I'm just going to edit a greeter internal class, and that class is called greeter internal. It is in a separate package that has internal in the name, and it's using an external library, which is string utils, and it has a single method normalize that calls that library, right? So the idea usually with internal APIs is that you have implementation details that you don't want people to be exposed to, right? So here I'm using Apache Commons in that method, but maybe sometime in the future I'm going to change the dependency to something else, and I don't want this to be visible for my consumers, right? So. I'm going to continue the example. Let's see how I can use the dependency. So in the software model, I'm just saying that, okay, my main component has different source sets. The source set, which is named Java, has some dependencies on an external module, which is Apache Commons. So this is something that you will find in the software model. It's very, you, you can have a very fine granularity uh, of dependencies. You can put that on the source set level, and you can put that on the component level. So you can have dependencies specific to a source set, which is really, really nice to have. Okay, and now if I build that, it should be okay. All good. So, so far, nothing is really interesting. What is going to be interesting is what people would do with your library, okay? So let's do a simple experiment. I'm going to edit my common line interpreter and I'm going to use the internal API because, well, it's super practical to have a method called normalize that does exactly what I want, right? So my greeter, this CLI, is going to do this. Greeter internal dot normalize. So I am in the CLI module and I'm using a method, a class from the internal packages of the dependency. So what is going to happen? Any idea? Well, going to see. Let's compile that. Build. Everything is fine. Okay, so we have a big problem because we have an internal class and we let the consumer use them. And as soon as someone uses an internal API, you are doomed. And if you ever write Gradle plugins, you are in that situation, right? I, as a plugin author, use internal APIs. I shouldn't, but damn, this is really practical to use those APIs. 
So if you don't prevent me from doing it, I will use them. And as soon as I use them, we have a problem because we cannot upgrade those internal APIs. If we do that, we break people's code. This is a serious problem, and this is something that we need a solution for. So Jigsaw is about that. It's about fixing that problem. People should not use internal APIs. So we know that it's very practical to use internal APIs because they do what we want to do. But there is a reason why they're internal, because you want to evolve them much more quickly than your public APIs. And usually you want to have backwards compatibility on the public APIs, not on the internal ones. So how can we do that with the Java software model? It's actually pretty simple. What we're going to do is edit the build file of the common line, uh, the core modules. And I'm going just to add that section, which is called API. And it says export con acme. So I'm doing something which is very similar to what you have seen in the jigsaw descriptor module, but then it is directly in the build file, right? So I am in a Gradle build file and I'm declaring an API. So I can do this because it's a Java, it's a Jamie library spec, so the software model knows that you're building a Java component and in Java we will introduce that notion of API. And then, okay, I'm just saying, let's go with that API. So, I'm going to build the core component. And maybe you haven't noticed in the previous examples, but what we have when you do that is an additional step, which is there, called core main API jar. So what Gradle is doing here is creating a separate jar only with the types that are declared in the public API, right? And this makes a big difference, and I'm going to show you why. But the idea is that you can do this with Java 6, Java 7, Java 8, and it works, right? So I've just declared my API, and now what happens if I try to compile the common line module? Boom, now we have a compile time error. So this is exactly what we wanted. We wanted people not to use our internal types and just by declaring that API block in the build file, we have enforced that rule. We said, this is my public API, it exports a single package, so this is only what people can use when they will compile against my library. So the other types are not visible. So when you compile that, you have a compile time error. And again, this works with Java 7. It is not using Jigsaw, right? So you're just doing that now. So when I'm talking about a smooth migration path to Java 9, this is what we're talking about. You can start declaring internal APIs today. And then when you're ready, you're going to be able to enable Jigsaw and you will have nothing to do, basically. Is that okay? Cool. Okay, so just by doing this, actually we're bringing more than just enforcing the, 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 the boundaries of your modules. What we're providing is much more than that because just by declaring APIs, we can benefit from different side aspects. And one of them is really important, it's performance, right? We always want our builds to be faster. And one way to make them faster is to do nothing, right? You just modify something, and if you have nothing to do, do nothing. So this is why in Gradle, compared to other build tools, you can declare exactly the inputs and outputs of every task. This is super important because doing that, you're telling Gradle, okay, this is an input, so if the input doesn't change, the output will not change. And if you declare the outputs, you're saying if the output is missing, you have to re-execute the task. Declaring the API is an input, right? You're changing the types that you're exporting, so you're changing the output. So what does it mean for what we call compile avoidance? 
So yeah, maybe you didn't notice, I'm, I'm using Nano. So this is not a Mac, this is a Dell with Linux. It looks like a Mac, feels like a Mac, but it's, it's not a Mac. So first I need to fix my uh, example. Just to remove the use of the internal API, it was practical, but no, okay, since you prevent me from doing this, I'm not going to use that API anymore. So I need to rebuild the command line, and it works. Okay, now I compile, I fix the problem of using an internal API. Now I'm going to change my internal API. So I'm going to edit my greeter internal class, and I'm going to rename a method you will notice that it's a public method. If I do that, I have to edit my main greeter class because it's going to use the new method name. So greeter internal dot norm instead of normalize. Okay. So just, I'm going to wait there. So what will happen in a typical build if I try to build everything? Anyone has an idea? Is there any Maven user here? Whoa, cool. <laughs> so what would the Maven user see? You had an idea? Yeah. So you're going to recompile everything. Okay. So why are you going to recompile everything? Just because you have the CLI module and it depends on the core module, right? So you change the core module. So it's an input of the CLI module. So since the input changed, you're going to recompile. But what, what we've done there is changing an internal API. And since we've enforced that we cannot use the internal classes in the dependencies, what we're going to see there is very different. I'm going to build my project. And what we see is that, okay, I have to recompile the core module because the internal API changed. I have to regenerate a main API jar because maybe the public API changed. But then the public API hasn't changed in practice. We didn't change any class from the public API. So the greeter class didn't change. It's still the same Java classes. It's still the same public methods, et cetera, et cetera. Nothing changed on the API side of your library. Everything that changed was in the internal side. So when I'm going to compile the common line, actually I don't have to do anything because I know that nothing changed. So this, this is awesome. Just think about the number of projects that you have that have a dependency chain. Right? And if you happen to change the first one, you recompile everything. And often this is exactly what happens because you edit the files from the main core module and then you have a problem because you're just losing your time. You know that what you change is not what you had. So there is much more than what I've shown in, in that example. Compile avoidance actually works even if you change private methods of public types. So what we do is just much more than extracting the public types from the, the, the jar, so just not copying the, the, the classes. It does more. Actually, it makes them totally dumb. It removes everything, all the implementation from the, 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 the classes. So say that you have a foo class, which is a public method, a public class, and inside you have several methods, some are public, some are private. When we generate the API jar, what we do is that we remove all the public, all the private methods from that, and we remove all the, uh, all the bodies of the methods. So it means that if you change the name of a private method, if you change the order of the methods in the public API, if you change the name of the parameters maybe, we know, because we're building Java applications, we know that in that case it's not a problem, right? We know that the consumers don't have to change the bytecode basically. Because the name of the methods that you can call are the same. 
So maybe it's a problem for reflection, but for the compiler, it is not a problem. For the compiler, it's not a problem because we know that a private method cannot be called for a Java program. It's not possible to do it. So if you change the method body, if you change yeah, the method names, etc., etc., we won't recompile. And again, it is a huge benefit in performance just because you won't recompile everything. And this happens a lot, even from the IDE. Well, this is what we do every day, so we keep changing, changing things. So, really, when we're talking about APIs in the Java world, what we're talking about is not interface and classes. This is not the case, right? It is classes, and those classes expose methods. And this is all. So it's more the application binary interface in terms of concept. It is what a compiler needs to be able to compile. What happens at runtime is a different problem. So what we won't do in Gradle, if you're using Java 8 and that at runtime you're using reflection to call those private methods, you will be able to do it just because the JVM doesn't have a module system. But as soon as you're going to use Java 9, it's going to be enforced by the JVM at runtime. Okay, so one more aspect of this, and this is part of the title actually of this talk, is about target platforms. So we all lived in the JVM ecosystem on a lie that is compiled once everywhere. Okay, this doesn't work. So we have to deal with different target platforms. If you run on Java 6, it's not the same as running on Java 7, Java 8, etc. So what I'm going to do, do this the, in this example is edit my CLI module and I'm going to add two lines. I'm going to say it is targeting Java 7 and targeting Java 8. What it does, so the Java software model prevents what we call a component report. So I'm going to show the component report. And this component report is going to show me that actually by declaring two platforms, I will generate two different binaries, two different jars. One for Java 7, one for Java 8. Okay. Why is this important to have two different artifacts? Because, maybe you know it, maybe not, but if you compile for Java 8, the target bytecode is not the same as Java 7. That's one aspect. So if you have a consumer that wants to depend on your library and you happen not to specify the target platform, there are changes that actually you're using APIs that are specific to Java 7 and not available in Java 8, and you will never know. The second aspect of declaring target platforms is that dependency management is different. So that, this is probably for me the, the, the most important aspect of declaring target platforms in Java. So th in this talk, I don't have time to talk about dependency management, but we have in the software model what we call variant aware dependency management. So this is highly inspired from what you can see in the Android ecosystem. The idea is that you have different variants of your application and the target platform is one variant dimension and the dependencies of those different variants are different. So a typical example that I give is how many of you had problem with uh, dealing with exercises in the past, right? Probably, probably, yeah, you just had that problem, okay? You have two versions of exercises on ClassPass just because at some point in the JDK they decided to come with their own version of exercises. And then you have a conflict, and then you have to deal with boot class path, and then maybe it doesn't work because you're deploying on two different environments, etc., etc. So actually, depending on the JDKs, on the, well, the, the runtime on which you will deploy your application, you have de different dependency sets. Another example is typically uh, web applications, right? So if you deploy to Apache Tomcat, you probably don't need the same dependencies as if you deploy on Whitefly. 
because the first one comes naked, basically. You have to provide your own version of Hibernate, etc., etc. But if you deploy in Wildfly, actually, you come with Hibernate pre-bundled. So the deployment environment implies different dependencies. And this is super important. You want to be able to declare different dependencies depending on your target platform, on your target deployment environment, etc., etc. And it's the build tool that should resolve everything. So you must declare what you want, and then the build tool will resolve everything and provide all the artifacts for the different combinations. OK, so let's move on with this example. So here, I'm running on JDK 8, this example. So that's why you can see that the tool chain using Java 8, and here I have uh, Java 7 to chain, uh, Java 8 to chain for Java 7. So what I did is trying to build my application. So the command line is using Java 7 and Java 8 as a target platform. And actually I'm trying to compile that, but remember I didn't edit my call library. So since I'm running on Java 8, the call library only has been compiled with the JDK that Gradle uses. And since I was running on JDK 8, the call library is only compiled for Java 8. So when I'm going to compile my command line with Java 7, Gradle is telling me, hey, you're trying to compile for Java 7, but there's no compatible version of that dependency that is compiled with Java 7. Right? So it won't work. You have to do something. And the something is pretty easy. I have to edit my call library to make it platform aware too. So I'm going to add the two platforms. So before that, if I just try to compile the Java 8 version of the command line, it works. Just because we know that we have a compatible version of the command line over the call library. The problem is really on the Java 7 variant because we don't provide a binary which is compatible in terms of bytecode. It is not. So usually what happens today is that, okay, let's pause that is that you have some libraries, take Guava typically, and they provide different artifacts. Guava, uh, Java 1.5, Guava, Java 1.6, etc., etc. And this is how you solve it. The problem is that you can have two different libraries that depend on Guava and different version of Guava, so you have to deal with the conflicts. The idea with that is to change that model and model it properly. You, we, we we're saying, okay, we have a Java 6 version, Java 7 version, and it's the build tool that will resolve everything. So let's fix our core module and introduce the target platform, Java 7, Java 8. And then hopefully now I will produce a Java 7 library, a Java 8 library of my dependency. So it's going to compile fine. So if I didn't mess up with my screencast and I do Gradle, please clean, uh, please compile the command line, it should compile. And it does. And what I see is that actually it compiled both versions of the command line. The version for Java 7 and the version for Java 8. So the last thing I want to do is to show, yeah? So I'm not, this example is not using toolchain, so I will come back with toolchain. So it's using Java 8, but setting automatically the target byte version to Java 7. So what I did just here is just commenting out the Java 8 version of the dependency. So I'm not just providing no Java 7 version. So what is going to happen, okay? The dependency is only built for Java 7, and I'm going to compile the core component with Java 7 and Java 8. So, any ideas? So I have two components. Is it going to work? Yes, no, don't know. I want to eat. It works. Why? Again, because we have some knowledge about what is Java. And we know that if you have a library with Java compact for Java 7, it will run on Java 8. So by default, if you have the exact matching bytecode version, we will take it. So Java 8, Java 8, 
Java 9, Java 9. But if you have a compatible version, and that's the only version available, we will use it. So it's pretty easy. OK, so now we want Jigsaw, right? So we're ready. We have declared our public APIs. Just our target platform. And what we're going to do in the bonus here is that we will make Gradle generate module info file for you. So let's try this. So this time I'm running on Java 9. And I can see that it added a, a new component, which is using a toolchain Java 9 and target platform Java 9. But so this is my, uh, the sources are available on my GitHub. If you check this out, you would see that I have actually modified my build file to generate an additional source set. And that source set will contain the Jigsaw descriptor. And the Jigsaw descriptor is based on what I have declared in my build. So I'm going to do that. And then I can compile. And boom, I have all my variants available. And the Jigsaw variant is built. More importantly, if I take a look, actually in the build, in the generate sources, I can find my module info file. So we're not going to say that this is what we're going to say to do in the future. Maybe we will not generate that descriptive file for you, just because it is a simplified version of the module file in the sense that we don't have the services that you can find in the module descriptor. There are some things that make sense to be in a build file. Some may not. It depends. So maybe we're going to do that in the future. Maybe just suggest to have a task that generates it for you, and maybe you will edit. In any case, it is compatible. It works with Jigsaw. And we can do it. So what's next? And actually, we missed the toolchain support. So what we have today is something that takes a, a JDK and executes using a different bytecode version. But what we want to do is really to use JDK 8 to compile the JDK 8 sources, JDK 9 to compile the JDK 9 version, etc., etc. So even in JDK 9, you have a, a new option which is called dash release. And this is going to use an old version of the JDK to compile, uh, well, an old version of the APIs to compile. So this is important. So we don't have it yet, but we're going to provide that. We're going also to detect automatically all the installs of Java that you have on your computer, on your CI server, et cetera, et cetera. So make it easy to use the proper tool chain when it is available. So today you can use a different tool chain. It is possible, but you have to tweak your build file, basically to change the, 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 the path to the binary on each binary. It is possible, and actually my example does it. So if you go to my GitHub account, you, you, in the examples, you will see how it is done. Uh, we want to support also uh, JLink. So JLink is a tool that works only if you have everything on the module path. So probably, again, not again in, in 10 years. So this, this is super nice. The idea is that you will provide an image of your application with the JDK bundle, basically, but only with the necessary bits. So only the modules that are necessary to your application. And it's standalone, it can run on a different platform. So it's some kind of native binary, but using the VM. OK, I'm running out of time. If you're interested in the top topic of Javanen support, please try the latest milestone of Gradle, milestone 2. And you can find all the specs about Java 9 support, especially in the new software model. But again, we're going to backport that. So if you want to get involved, just check out the GitHub repo and you have all the specs of what we want to do with Java 9. Uh, yeah, I have uh, maybe a couple of questions. Yes? No. No. So it's not going to be deprecated. The idea is that uh, we're focusing on bringing all that goodness to the old model first and then slowly provide people. It, it is. It is uh, if you take the Swift support, typically, it is using this, the new software model. 
And the idea is that for new ecosystem, it's much easier to do because it's brand new and people don't have to migrate. For Java, it's different because you have so many builds existing and we want to provide all those goodness first to the old model. So for Java, it's not going to, to be out of incubation anytime soon. For the different ecosystem, the native, etc., probably yes. One last question, yes? So the, yeah, so that's a good point. We don't have support for external modules for that, just because we missed the descriptors. So this is going. This is also something that, that is in the specs. We want to, to have that and provide our own descriptors so that even if you get external dependencies, you get that benefit too. Yeah, good point. So just before, uh, you, yeah, I can take questions after the talk. Just I'm running out of time. So yeah, if you want to work on that, we're also hiring. And the last thing is that these slides were actually using Gradle to build. So it's a ASCII doctor based, and uh, Gradle builds the ASCII doctor with Reveal.js. And actually, if you yeah, if you go to the link and click on that, you can see the build receipt, the well, the build scan. I must get used to the new name, build scan, for for these slides. So. It's pretty nice to see that with Gradle, you can just do something else that just code. You can use slides too, you can build slides. Anyway, thank you. Yeah, if you want to have the, the slides, go to my GitHub account, check it out, and yeah, come to me after the talk if you have more questions. Thank you.